Continuing our journey through the Bible, Nehemiah chapters 8 through 10. Now, chapter 10 is another one of those chapters that has a lot of names. And so we'll let John wrestle with that one tonight. Uh, but uh, we have some exciting reading, actually. I had a difficult time uh, choosing uh, a text this morning because there is so much richness in these chapters, especially 8 and 9. But we did sort of settle down on chapter 9 as Nehemiah, in his prayer, speaks of the character and the nature of God. Now, many times people make a mistake in thinking that the Bible reveals two different gods. I've heard people say, well, I like the God of the New Testament. He is such a loving and, and forgiving and compassionate God. Uh, I like the God of the New Testament. But we read stories such as Noah and the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and other events like this in the Old Testament. And people say, well, I really don't care too much for the God of the Old Testament, you know, that God of judgment and uh, the God that uh, brought destruction upon uh, the wicked and the evil. In reality, there's only one God. And there are the two aspects, you might say, of the one God. There is that side of God that is compassionate, that is merciful, that is gracious, that is long-suffering, that is slow to anger. But he is the same God who is a righteous God, who is a just God, and because of his righteousness, he must bring judgment upon the guilty. And so the Old Testament does reveal a compassionate, loving, merciful God. When God first revealed himself to Moses, the Lord revealed himself as Jehovah, Jehovah God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving the iniquity and the transgressions and sins. Now, the Bible purports to be a revelation of God to man. God revealing himself to man. And not only does the Bible purport to be God's revelation to man, but also proves itself to be the true revelation of the true God to man. There are many concepts that people have of God. And thus the many religions that deal with various concepts of God. The Greeks had their concepts of God that were revealed in Greek mythology. The Romans had their concepts of God in Roman mythology. And it seems like different cultures of the world all have their own concept and idea of God. And people say, well, with so many different concepts of God, how can I know which is indeed the true God? And the Bible purports to reveal to you the true God, God's revelation of himself. Let me say that beginning with an earth base, man can never really discover God completely. You have an impossible situation of the finite man trying to understand an infinite God. And so as man creates his concepts of God, it is really an enlargement of the man himself. It starts out with the premise, if I were God, this is 
what I would be like. This is what I would do. This is how I would be if I were God. And so we take our own concept and we project ourselves out to this immensity and we worship that as my God. But if you will draw the lines back from this concept that a man has created of God, you will, as you come to the place of convergence, you will find the man himself and you will realize that his God is only an enlargement of himself. David recognized that when men made gods, they made gods like themselves. He was contrasting. He said, uh, why should the heathen now say, uh, where is now your God? He said, our God's in the heaven. He's done what he pleases. But their gods, oh, they are silver or gold. They are made out of wood. They have eyes, but the eyes can't see. They have ears, but the ears can't hear. They have feet, but the feet can't walk. Mouths they have, but they can't speak. In other words, David is recognizing that men have made their gods, but they've made their gods like themselves. They've put eyes on their little idols because they have eyes, noses because they have noses, feet because they have feet. But when a man makes a god, though it is a projection of himself, it is inferior to himself because the feet that I've carved on my little god can't walk. The eyes that I've carved can't see. The ears that I've carved can't hear. And so uh, he sees how that man makes his gods rather than accepting the true God who has revealed himself to man in the scriptures. Job said, can you by searching discover God? Can you gain a perfect understanding of the Almighty? And the answer is obviously no. David said, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of man to see if there was any who understood. But the Lord said he found none. There is none righteous, no, not one. As God revealed himself to Moses, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, that doesn't sound like a vengeful God just anxious to destroy the disobedient. Make no mistake, though, he is a just God, and yet he is so long-suffering. He is so patient. He is so slow to anger. Yes, he did destroy the world at the time of Noah. But from the time that God said to Noah, my spirit will not always strive with man. For God saw that the earth was corrupt. The imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. There was violence, there was murder, there were rapes, there was all kinds of things going on. And God said, my spirit won't always strive with man. But after God said that, he continued to strive with them for a hundred years that they might change, that they might repent from their wicked ways, that they might turn to him that he would not have to destroy them. But after waiting a hundred more years, God brought his judgment and the earth was destroyed by the flood. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God, but God gave them opportunity after opportunity to repent. But there came that time where justice had to be served. And if he is a just God, then the wicked must be punished. You see, it isn't just to let the wicked go unpunished. It would not be just for a judge to say to uh, these two fellows that were snipers and terrorized the East Coast, it wouldn't be just for a judge to say, I dismiss all of the charges. 
these men can go free. That wouldn't be justice. That would be the corrupting of justice. And God can't just say of the wicked, well, you're okay, I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to pardon you, you're all right. No, justice to be served, the wicked must be punished. But God is slow to anger, and over and over again in the scriptures you read, God is slow to anger. But it is possible to go beyond the reach of God's mercy and the reach of God's grace. We see people today who do not believe that the wicked should be punished. They are out there oftentimes with signs. But why would a person hold up signs and defend the wicked and the punishment that has been meted out by the courts upon the wicked. Why would they do that? Well, I think there are two reasons. First of all, they're nuts. <laughs> and secondly, they are wicked. And because they are wicked, uh, they don't believe that the wicked should be punished. God said in Job, chapter 40, verse 8, Will you disannul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you might appear to be righteous? And, and th there are people that do that. They, they say, well, how can a God of love, you know, bring judgment and so forth? And, and they are sort of saying, I am really more righteous than God because I wouldn't do that. Note the prayer of Nehemiah. In verse 17 here of chapter 9. He said, but you are a God that is ready to pardon. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and you did not forsake them. Now, what is the context in which Jeremiah declares this wonderful character of God's compassion and grace and mercy and his readiness to pardon? Look at the context, beginning with verse 14. Jeremiah said, you made known unto them, I mean, Nehemiah said, you made known unto them your holy Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was the uh, sign of God's covenant with them. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. He gave them his laws. And he said, if you will obey these, I will bless you. I will make you prosperous. God said all the wonderful things you, you can have and I will do for you if you just keep these commandments. And God said, but if you break them, then this will be the consequence of your breaking these commandments. Now, having given them then the law, he then said, now as a sign of this covenant that I've made, the sign of the covenant of blessings, I'm going to have you keep the Sabbath day holy. And that will be the sign of our covenant. You're keeping the Sabbath day. And so it was the sign of God's covenant with the nation of Israel that if they would keep his law, that they would be blessed. You made known to them your holy Sabbath or your covenant. You made known to them your precepts, your statutes, and the laws by your hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought forth water for them out of the rock when they were thirsty. And you promised that they should go in and possess the land which you had sworn to give to them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly. Now this is what God had done, but yet in response to God, our fathers dealt proudly. They hardened their necks. They would not listen to your commandments. They refused to obey you nor pay any attention to the miracles that you did among them. Instead, they hardened their necks, and their, in their rebellion, they sought to appoint a captain to lead them back to Egypt. But in that context, 
Jeremiah said of God there in verse 17, the latter part of that verse. But you are a God who is ready to pardon. In all that they're turning their backs, hardening, yet you were ready to pardon. You're gracious, merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and you did not forsake them. So, did they appreciate the grace, the mercy, the kindness of God? Read on, verse 18. But they greatly provoked God by making a golden calf and worshiping it and declaring that it was the God that delivered them out of Egypt. Verse 19. Yet you in your manifold mercies did not forsake them there in the wilderness. But the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them the light and the way wherein they should go. Now, though they forsook God, he did not forsake them. He still manifested his presence with them. He still guided them by that pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. God's graciousness was further manifested to them in verse 20. You also gave them your good spirit to instruct them. You did not take your manna from them. You also gave them water for their thirst for 40 years. And you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. And beside this, you gave them kingdoms and nations, and you also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the land which you had promised to their fathers that they should possess. So they went in and they possessed the land. You subdued the inhabitants of the land before them. They conquered strong cities. They came into a rich land. They possessed the houses that were full of provisions. They had wells that they did not have to dig, vineyards and olive orchards that they did not plant. They had an abundance of fruit trees. They ate to their full. They became fat. They delighted themselves in your great goodness. These are all manifestations of God's grace. These people didn't deserve these things. And still God did these things for them. How did they respond to this graciousness of God and this goodness of God? Verse 26. In spite of all your goodness, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you. They rejected your law. And then they killed the prophets which exhorted them to turn back to you. And they did things to provoke you. Therefore, you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who vexed them. But note to the extent that God was gracious and merciful before he brought his judgment. After all of this, after all of their rebellion, the hardness of their hearts, their refusal to accept God and turn to him, their refusal to fellowship with God, they're killing the prophets who are there telling them, you need to repent and seek God's forgiveness. They didn't want to hear that. And finally, God gave them over and deliver them to their enemies. But even then, we read that God's mercy and grace were once again manifested. And in the time of trouble, verse 27, when they cried unto you, you heard from heaven, and according to your manifold mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Even now, when finally God's judgment begins, they turned back to God, and God was ready to pardon and to forgive them. But what did the people do then? But after you delivered them, verse 28, they did evil again before you, and therefore you left them in the hand of their enemies who had dominion over them, 
and yet they t returned and cried to you, and you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. So this was a repeated thing. They would turn away from God. They would be delivered to their enemies. They would cry unto God, and God would forgive and restore. And then they would turn away from God, and they would go into the captivity, and they would cry unto God, and God would have mercy and restore. This was a, read the book of uh, Judges again, and you find that this is just a, a, a common pattern with these people. So, the response of God to their rebellion is found in verse 30. Yet for many years you put up with them. You testified against them by your spirit in the prophets. But still they would not listen. And for this reason you gave them over to their enemies. Nevertheless, for your great mercy's sake, you did not allow them to be consumed. And you did not forsake them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant and shows his mercy. Now let me ask you a question and I want a straight answer. If you were God, what would you have done to these people? I'll tell you what I would have done. I mean, after the second or third time, I'd say, forget you. And I would have wiped them out and I would have raised up another generation or something, you know, to fellowship with and to serve me. I would not have put up with this to the extent that God did. Over and over and over he showed his mercy. He showed himself to be forgiving, compassionate, merciful. Now remember, this is the God of the Old Testament. We're in the Old Testament. He is a God who is full of compassion, a God who is gracious, a God who is merciful, long-suffering, and slow to anger. Now, note, as Nehemiah does speak of the fact that God ultimately gave them over to their enemies, he puts this judgment of God in the right context. They deserved it because they wouldn't listen to God. They hardened their hearts against God. So this judgment that ultimately came is something that they totally deserved. It's important that you see the judgment of God in the correct context. God is not unrighteous when he sends his judgment upon people. He is totally, in fact, it's interesting. In the book of Revelation, when it tells about this great time of God's wrath and judgment that is coming upon our earth, in the midst of some of the most fierce and fearful kind of judgments of God, there are voices that come forth from the throne of God that say, holy and righteous and true are thy judgments, O Lord. In the midst of this fierce outpouring of God's wrath, the righteousness of God's judgment will be acknowledged from the throne of God. For righteousness to prevail, the wicked must be punished. But I would like to suggest to you that God uses that as the last resort. When God has exhausted every other means. He then, to be a just God, must then bring forth his judgment against the wicked. When people refuse to respond to his love and mercy, to his constant entreaties and offers of forgiveness, if they will just turn to him, he will pardon their sins. But if they will close their eyes and their ears, 
If they stiffen their necks and refuse to turn, they leave God with no other option. He must punish them to be just. God was ready and desiring to pardon the people, Nehemiah said, because he is gracious and he is merciful. He sent his prophets to call them to repent and to return to God, but they imprisoned the prophets and killed them. He sustained them. He did not forsake them. He delivered them into the hands of the enemies only after they totally rejected his love and his offers of forgiveness. Coming now to the New Testament, the God of the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, as Paul is talking about the God of the New Testament, he tells us that the wrath of God is coming upon this world. And he gives the reasons why God's wrath is going to be poured out upon our world. Because when they knew God, they would not glorify him as God. But they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools because they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. That's describing the world that you and I are living in today. A world that gives more honor to animals than to people. More honor and more, uh, you know, a tree becomes more important than a man. Our government protects the egg of an eagle. If you destroy an eagle's egg, there is a thousand dollar fine. But yet it supports and finances the destruction of a child in the mother's womb. When you put a greater value on animals than you do human beings, there's something awfully wrong with that society. It is a society that worships and serves the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. And so God said, because of this, he gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged the natural relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned the natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committing indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which they knew they should not do. They are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are arrogant and boastful. They are faithless, Heartless, ruthless, senseless. Even though they know the righteous decree of God that those which do such things deserve death, they not only do them, but they take pleasure in watching others do them. Halloween evening, as I was watching the news, and that's about the only thing left, well, except for football. I, I find it difficult to watch TV anymore, and even the news. 
Uh, I find it oftentimes very difficult to watch because they always like to put some kind of a little scintillating sexual innuendo within it, it seems. And Halloween evening, you know what dominated the news that they came back and showed several times over? The events, the big Halloween party going up on up in Hollywood. Well, actually in West Los Angeles. And all of these perverts in their crazy get-ups, dressing in drag and all of that kind of, I mean, and they kept going back to that and sort of, you know, making that the big news of the evening. That's what Halloween now is all about. And I was so disgusted, I just turned it off. I thought, this isn't news, this is corruption. Our world today is described for us here in Romans chapter 1. As Paul tells us of the consequences of a society that rejects God. These are the things that will happen. These are the kinds of things that people will do. But note at the end, he said not only do they do them, but they take pleasure in those that do them. Now, they, there are things that you would never, never do. Blowing people apart. And yet, how many times do you watch this being done in movies and they say, well, this is entertainment. Are you entertained by seeing people murdered? Are you entertained by seeing people undress themselves? Are you entertained by watching people commit adultery or fornication? Does that entertain you? If so, then you're in this crowd that Paul is talking about, taking pleasure in those that do them. This society in which we live is ripening for judgment. And as Paul continues into chapter 2, he goes right into chapter 2 and he says, hey, you're inexcusable, old man. If you're judging these people and yet you in your mind are doing the same thing, you're taking pleasure in them doing it. You're inexcusable. He said, for we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those that will do such things. But do you think that you shall escape the judgment of God? Do you despise the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and long-suffering? Do you not know that, it, that the goodness of God was intended to bring you to repentance? But your hardness and impenitent heart is treasuring up unto you wrath in the day of wrath that the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds." Even as the children of Israel ultimately came to that place where God said, that's enough. And he turned them over to judgment. And he brought his judgment upon them. So we in America have come to that place that God describes for us in Romans chapter 1 where God says, I've given up. I've given them over. And that certain fearful looking forward to the fiery indignation of God's wrath whereby he will devour his adversaries. That's the God of the New Testament. He is the same God of the Old Testament. He is a God that is full of compassion. He is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He is long-suffering. He's a God who is very reluctant to forsake his people. But he is also a righteous and just God. One who cannot allow evil to go on unpunished forever. And one day, 
will bring his righteous judgment upon the world in which we live because of its hardness of heart, the stiffening of the neck, the refusal to change and to live after his commandments. We're getting close. And when God's judgment falls, you will be on one of two sides. Those of who Paul describes in Romans 8, those of whom there is no condemnation, for they are in Christ Jesus, or those who will stand condemned and face the wrath of a loving God who is also a righteous God. God is giving to you again today another opportunity to turn from your sin, to repent, He's been so patient. He's been so merciful. He has been so slow to anger that many times people misinterpret that and think that he's too weak to punish. He's too soft. But they will discover when they've gone too far that the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven from all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who have been holding the truth of God but still living in unrighteousness. I trust that's not you.